Hello again. Chapter 45, April 19th. Big surprise when I got home from school today. My mother was there. You sick, I asked her? Nah, just home, she said. You got fired. She chuckled. Actually, I quit. Well, I have quit. I'll stu still do it at part-time, but only on my schedule. The mall can get along without me. Why, I asked. She shrugged. Well, with Scooter home now? Now, really, would you rather have my money or my time, she asked me. Your money, I laughed. I knew I shouldn't have asked. What about Mrs. Linfont? She did get fired. Good. So I'll be making dinner tonight. Not good, she laughed again. The dinner wasn't bad for my mother anyways. She's got possibilities. There were four of us, me, Abby, Mom, and Scooter. Maybe you can do your painting again now, said Abby. I don't like that one that you did of me as a baby. I want you to paint me like I am now, she posed. Gorgeous, she says. My mother made a frame of her fingers and peered through it. Yeah, we'll see. Is Daddy quitting his job too? Her face showed what she wanted the answer to be. No, honey, said my mom. Not unless you want to live in a hut. Yeah, I do, piped Abby. My mother wagged her head. I keep saying things I really shouldn't. Well, there's one thing you'll be glad about. I really will be buying some of your clothes at the second time around store from now on. Abby clapped. Goody, she said. My mother turned to me. Oh, no, I said. She looked half sad. You can live without $30 shirts. We're all going to have to give up something, Crash. I'm selling my car. Why well, ain't wearing no used underwear, I told her. No used underwear, she said. Just some things. And look on the bright side. Now you won't have to waste so much time comparing price tags with your friends. Abby laughed. I stuck my face in my food. I felt like punching a wall. Scooter was silent the whole time, turning his head to each person who talked, his smile tilting, his whole body tilting in his chair. No sneakers, I said. I thought of my money in my dresser drawer. I had almost saved up enough for the new pair that I saw. They were better than Mike's. You can't make me spend my own money at the thrift shop, I told my mom. Nope, I wouldn't dream of it, she said. She came into my room when I went to bed. You're not going to tuck me in like some big baby every night now, are you? No, honey, just tonight. As she was heading out, I said, Just one more thing, Mom. She stopped. What's that, Crash? If you buy me stuff from the thrift shop? Yeah. Please don't tell anybody. I can't get to sleep. I keep thinking of the race off tomorrow. I know there's no way that I can lose, but I still feel very nervous. I want to be on the big bed boat. Ever since Webb came dorking and whistling up the street that first day, he never ever saw me without saying hi. Until today. Not at school, not on the track. It was weird. Tonight, even though the coach ran us ragged at practice, I heard Webb sprinting past the house. My father bought a new spark plug for the mower. Guess what, though? The gas cap is missing. Chapter 46, April 20th. I hardly ate breakfast. I didn't pay attention to class. I kept thinking of the race off today and the pen relays Friday. The 4 by 100 meter relay means four runners, each run 100 meters. Each runner passes the baton to the next runner. The baton looks like a foot-long pipe, but it's light and it's made of aluminum. Since I'm the fastest, I'll probably run the anchor leg. The anchor gets the baton last. The anchor crosses the finish line. The anchor, anchor is your chance to win. The anchor gets all the glory. All day long, I pictured Friday's race. Huber leads off. He hands the baton to Knowles halfway through the first turn. Knowles tears down the back stretch, hands it to Caruso. I crouch. I look past my back shoulder. They're all coming, eight sprinters sprinting. I pick out Caruso. He's leaning into the final turn. He's 15 minutes from me. He's 15, 10 meters. I take off, five meters. I drag my left hand behind me, palm open, fingers spread. Hit, hit! I feel it. I feel the baton smack into my left hand. I curl my fingers around it. I switch it to my right hand and take off. Down the chalk-striped chalk -striped brick colored lane. I'm dead last. Ten meters behind everybody. It's hopeless. By the time I hit the straightaway, I'm passing the next to the last runner. Then the next and the next. 40,000 people leap to their feet. 80,000 eyes slide from the leader to the kids who's coming out of nowhere. Who is he, they ask, and the answer come. 
comes. It's Coogan. It's Coogan. It's Crash Coogan of Springfield. I pass another, and now there are only three ahead of me. But there's not enough time. He can't do it, they scream. And now there's two runners ahead of me. And the red ribbon across the finish line seems close enough to be blindfolded, to be a blindfold, and they're hanging from the railing and stomping on the scoreboard, and there's only one ahead of me now. And the human hurricane is chasing me around the track. I hear it blowing at my back, and I am on the leader's shoulder, and for an instant the world freezes because we are dead even. Seeing us sideways, we look like one, and I remember the coach saying in a close race, the one who wins will lean. The one who leans will win. So now with a one last gasp, I throw my arms back and my chest forward, and the red ribbon breaks like a butterfly across my shirt. I slow down, I stop, I stand on the brick-colored track, I leave I heave the button into the air. I heave the baton into the air high as the pennants wave over the stadium and the hurricane finally catches up with me. I close my eyes and let it wash over me. I hear Coogan. I kept running that dream all day until the coach's whistle blew and he called race off and there I was heading across. Heading across to the field to the starting line, the others trotted. I walked. I wasn't in a hurry. The stands were empty. A school bus moved in the distance beyond the football goalpost. Under the crossbar and between the uprights, like in a framed picture, stood three people. For once, Webb's parents didn't look so old, not compared to the man standing between them. He was shorter than them and real skinny. But he was standing straight and he was standing by himself. No cane, no walker, just two legs. Ninety-three years old. Maybe it was the Missouri River mud. The thought came to me. They would have liked each other, Scooter and Henry Wilhide Webb III. Two storytellers, both from the great flat open places. One a prairie of grass, one of water. Both came to watch when no one else was there. Why exactly was he here? Did he know about me? Did he know that his great-grandson could not win the race off and so would not run in the pen relays? I wondered if Webb felt safe at his great, in his great-grandfather's bed. The cinder track crunched under my feet. There were five of us in the race. Me, Webb, two other seventh graders, and a sixth grader. The coach put us in the lanes. Me and Webb were side by side. Again, Webb hadn't said a word to me all day. We milled around behind the starting blocks, nervous, shaking, at our, shaking out our arms and legs, everything as quiet as if the coach had already said, Ready? The other team members, jumpers, throwers, distance runners, had all stopped their practicing to watch. A single hawk kited over the sky. And then, suddenly I remembered, I saw something, a gift. A gift for a great-grandfather from North Dakota. Maybe for all great-grandfathers. But the thing was, only one person could give that gift. And it wasn't the great-grandson. Not on his fastest day alive. It was me. I hated it being me. I tried not to see, but everywhere I looked, there it was. It was the gift. Let's go, boys, shouted the coach. A voice closer to me said, good luck. It was Webb. Sticking out his dorky hand, smiling that old dorky smile of his, no button, I shook his hand and it occurred to me that because he was always eating my dust, the dun, dumb fish cake had never won a real race and probably didn't know how. And now there wasn't time. I leaned into him and I said, don't forget to lean. I told him. His face went blank. The coach called, ready? I got down, feet in the blocks, right knee on the tracks, thumb and forefingers on the chalk, eyes straight down, and right then, for the first time in my life, I didn't know if I wanted to win. Set, knee up, rear up, eyes up. The coach says the most important here, thing here is to focus your mind. You are a coiled steel spring ready to dart out at the sound of the gun. So what comes into my head instead? Ollie the one-armed Ollie the one-armed octopus. He didn't disappear until the gun went off. I was behind not only Webb but everybody. No problem. Within ten strides I picked up three of them. That left Webb. He was farther ahead of me than usual, but that was because of my rotten start. At the halfway mark, where I usually passed him, he was still ahead, and I still didn't know if I wanted to win. I gassed it. The gap closed. I could hear him puffing. 
Like a second set of footsteps, cinder flicks from his feet pecked at my shins. I was still behind. The finish line was closing. I kicked in the afterburners. Ten meters from the white string, we were shoulder to shoulder, breath to breath, grandson to great-grandson. And it felt new. It felt good. Not being behind, not being ahead, but being even. And just like that, a half a breath from the white string, I knew it. There was no time to turn to him. I just barked out, lean! He leaned, he threw out his chest, he broke the string, he won. We will stop right there.